Okay, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the class for today. Uh, in the last uh, couple of classes, we have been looking at uh, the biodiversity and climate change. I think uh, you have seen the different aspects of uh, climate change on biodiversity, the impact of climate change on biodiversity. I think uh, in your syllabus, you are expected to deal a bit more, that is uh, the food behavior, then uh, the development, then uh, reproduction, all these things of the biodiversity. Anyway, I will be uh, doing that towards the end because uh, it will be really boring if I start talking on and on about all these animals and plants and uh, climate change. We will go into a new topic now because uh, we will have a couple of weeks more of this class and uh, I will be dealing with uh, most of the parts of the syllabus during this time. So today I'm going to talk about uh, uh, global climate change adaptation and mitigation strategies. <clears throat> the first important thing in this uh, is to know what is adaptation and what is mitigation. Now these are two terms introduced by the United Nations Framework Convention for Climate Change when to explain the uh, impact of climate change and what we have to do with it. So mitigation, what exactly is mitigation? I will first to try to explain these two important words. Mitigation is an anthropogenic intervention to reduce the sources or enhance the sinks of greenhouse gases. What is it exactly? First, let us understand mitigation itself. An anthropogenic in intervention. Uh, it's a, it looks very high sounding, but simply it is human intervention. Human intervention to reduce the sources. What are the sources? Mostly the, fuel, the fossil fuels. And or enhance the sinks. What is the uh, sink? Sink is the place where these uh, sources are absorbed or the, uh, the various uh, greenhouse gases are absorbed or the sinks of greenhouse gases. So it is a, a human intervention to reduce the greenhouse gases in the sources or in the sinks. That is simple way of explaining it. Now, what is adaptation? Adjustment, ecological, social or economic in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli or their effects which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. It is a bit, bit more lengthy, although the matter is very simple. It's an adjustment, ecological or social or economic adjustment in natural or human systems in response to actual or expected climatic stimuli or their effects, which moderates harm or exploits beneficial opportunities. Now, it, I mean, the, the wording makes it very complicated, these definitions. But simply, I will try to explain it in a very simple terms. What is mitigation and what is adaptation? And what is the difference between the two? OK, now you are sitting in your room now. Now you are feeling very warm. OK, uh, so what are you trying going to do? You switch on your fan or you will switch on your air conditioner, whatever it is that you have. OK, eh? so what exactly is it? We are trying to reduce the temperature, the higher temperature by switching on the fan or air conditioner. It is actually a mitigation measure to reduce the temperature. Now, there is another alternative now, eh? which is more simple. And that is adaptation, I tell you. You are going to experience a warm temperature in your room. Maybe it is only now 30 or 32. Now, what happens? You say that it is fine. I don't need a fan and I don't need an air conditioner. I can sit comfortably here. It is okay. 
you are adjusting to that temperature, isn't it? You are adapting to that temperature. So it is simply actually uh, you are trying to mitigate in some of your cases and in some of the uh, other people's cases, you are trying to adapt to that condition. This is exactly the same thing. In the first, of course, there is, I mean, the, when it comes to climate change, there is a difference that mitigation actually means we have to be reducing, we have to make a measure, we have to make a method to reduce the greenhouse gas emission, or we have to make a device to absorb that greenhouse gas emission, uh, the emitted greenhouse gases. And in the second one, adapted, you have to adapt to that particular condition. And uh, by certain uh, social or economic or ecological situation, for example, uh, growing a forest, uh, city, I mean, uh, allowing a forest already there and you are protecting it simply, you know, that is uh, an adaptation measure. So this is the thing. Okay. Now let us uh, proceed further now, as you have understood the both the things. Okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> in case you don't understand, you know, you can type it. Uh, and then because my uh, speaker is not working somehow today, I will have to check what is the problem. So you do that. Okay. Uh, now, what are the general options for adaptation and mitigation? or how to combat the increase in greenhouse gases. That is the main topic that we are going to discuss. So what are the general options for adaptation and mitigation? We are going to see Then, what are the forestry options for adaptation or mitigation? That is also something else we are going to see today. Okay. Now, uh, the uh, in this particular uh, uh, diagram, you are uh, looking at a diagram where you have you have the human systems and earth systems. That is how the climate change or the global warming is affecting the earth system and how in turn it is affecting the human system. So all those in, in uh, yellow background, you see it is related to the human system and all those you see in the white background is related to the earth system. So let us see the earth system, the climate change, that is temperature change, temperature increase naturally, then precipitation change, extreme events, sea level rise. We have seen that these are the impacts of climate change. Now, what exactly is, uh, these are the, the, the climate process drivers, that is greenhouse gases, emissions and aerosols, all these, these are actually going to create this one. And in this one, the impact that is impacts and vulnerability, what are the problems? The ecosystems are going to be affected and water resources are going to be affected. So these are the something related to the earth system. Now coming to the human system, you find that the main thing is that socioeconomic development is going to be affected. So what exactly is it? The governance, the literacy, health, equity, population, socio-cultural preferences, production and consumption patterns, trade, technology, everything is going to be affected. So you see how these uh, the four items are interconnected. You can see from the arrows, all of them are interconnected. And it is here that you have to mitigate and it is here that in the, the, the socio-cultural preferences that you have to adapt. And it is in technology that we have to mitigate. So this is how we have to approach the whole thing. Earth systems are affected, so the human systems are affected. So we have to mitigate and adapt. Now, uh, maybe we will now look at uh, the mitigation opportunities uh, uh, in a uh, different ways, you know, sorry. The green technologies. Now, what are the uh, green technologies? Sorry, I'm uh, trying to. 
Okay. Uh, let us take it uh, one by one. The first one is uh, renewable energy. What is renewable energy? I will try to make you understand the thing. Say, this is a very diagrammatic view of uh, power generation from biomass. You should know that power generation is the main cause for evolution or emission of greenhouses, greenhouse gases like uh, carbon dioxide, methane, etc. Now, here you have a diagrammatic view of a forest and the logs are collected and finally it is going to the thermal plant. You should know that it is the firewood that is going into the thermal plant instead of the excavated coal or petroleum or diesel or whatever it is. And uh, then it is actually burned inside this uh, thermal plant. Electricity is produced and this is using oxygen of the atmosphere and this evolves carbon dioxide. But this carbon dioxide is now going back to the forest. It is absorbed by the green plants and during the process of photosynthesis, oxygen is also evolved. So this is actually working in a cycle. Understand? It's actually working in a cycle. Car I mean, the, the timber that is uh, produced is actually going into the thermal plant and CO2 is produced, but CO2 is absorbed by the forest and ox oxygen is released by this forest for everything. So the, the, there is no net production of carbon dioxide. That is the attractive part of the scheme. But for instance, you imagine that instead of this forest, you have coal or petroleum or products, whatever it is. And this is now going into this thermal plant and the CO2 is evolved, then naturally what is happening? The CO2 becomes a net product or a side product or an excess product, whatever you call it, in the atmosphere, thereby increasing the greenhouse gases. So if we are able to convert all our thermal plants into this kind of a setup, that is using biofuels coming from the green vegetation, then we can have a cyclic process, thereby no net evolution of carbon dioxide occurs. And this is actually renewable energy in one form. I hope you understand this one. Now, the second one is uh, solar energy from photovoltaic cells. This is actually a solar power plant in uh, Australia, but of course now we have got uh, in uh, say, Kochi itself, the entire airport is working on uh, solar panels. Yeah, I'm sure many of you have, have seen that. And uh, here you can see that uh, this is again renewable energy. Uh, we are not excavating anything. It is actually using the solar radiation. And these selenium panels are here, all erected here. And they convert that solar energy to the electrical energy which is used by this particular village, for example. So this is uh, another way, another uh, way of renewable energy and mitigating uh, uh, climate change. Now, energy from wind using wind turbines. Now, this has become very common in many countries, including India, not, not of course in Kerala, but you will see that it is very much there in Tamil Nadu, in very adjacent uh, state. Uh, if you go from Coimbatore to uh, the uh, further to the eastern side to Chennai, you will find that, sorry, no, not, not there. It is actually from Palga to Coimbatore, if you go there on the way, you will find many of these one, turbines, you know, uh, the wind turbines. And uh, this is very uh, uh, efficient in the sense of producing electricity but they are certainly very expensive. Now, another is power generation from the ocean waves. Ocean waves can also give rise to power if uh, properly it is uh, made, like, like a turbine is there and the waves are striking here and then made to work this turbine, thereby electricity is produced. So 
we, we had a plant in Virginia near Trivandrum, uh, but it has not uh, taken off even after several decades, you know. Actually, Kerala should be looking, I mean, and there India should be looking at power generation from the waves, but there seems to be a lot of technical uh, hang-ups in this one. Now, another one is uh, uh, hydroelectric energy. Say, for example, this is a dam where the water is actually coming and then, uh, so, I mean, this is the open stage of the water. Actually, it is not released like that. It is during the flooding time. Otherwise, it is actually sent through a tunnel into a powerhouse where the turbines are located and power is generated. And we have this system in Idiki and several other uh, hydroelectric projects in Kerala. In fact, uh, Kerala gets 40% of its power from hydroelectric projects. Uh, another country is uh, uh, Canada. Canada gets almost 100% of its power from hydroelectric projects. <clears throat> then, alternative fuels are another thing, apart from this uh, renewable energy. Hydrogen is used as a fuel in automobiles. So instead of our petrol and diesel, which we are now using, we now know that uh, it is it was actually a target for India. The Indian target was 1 million vehicles to run on hydrogen by 2020. Okay. But you know what is the situation now? Nothing has happened with re reference to hydrogen as a fuel. But electrical vehicles are coming, as you know. Uh, but uh, this is... Uh, uh, still an op a possibility that hydrogen can be produced much cheaper and uh, we can run many cars because in Japan they have they have got hydrogen fuel cells huh? because uh, almost like a compressed hydrogen it is written almost like a battery you get compressed hydrogen from petrol bunk like places and then you can just fit it into your car and then run so this is possible and uh, hydrogen when it is uh, uh, going to be burned in the car it won't give rise to any uh, greenhouse gases that is the advantage then another is consumption of petroleum products in kerala you should know you should know what is the extent of uh, our emissions of greenhouse gases in Kerala, uh, the account is like this. During the year 2018-19, we consumed 6.4 million tons of petroleum products for mainly transportation. Because we, do, we have no power plants working on uh, petroleum products. Then consumption of petroleum products in India. India, now Kerala, this is Kerala. In India at that time was 202 million tons. You see how much uh, pet petroleum products are consumed. Now, what is the problem? Huh? The problem is that one kilogram of petrol, it is not one liter, one kilogram of petrol gives rise to 2.33 kg of CO2. 2.33 kg of CO2. When you burn one kilogram of petrol, it is giving rise to 2.33 kg of carbon dioxide. Then instead of that, if you burn one kg of diesel, you see you are burning 2.77 kg of CO2. 2.77 kg of CO2. Now you would uh, ask the question, now is that the reason why the petrol and diesel prices are almost becoming very close and within a couple of years maybe the price of these two products will be the same yes to some extent that is the measure because petrol is actually less not i won't say less polluting less greenhouse gas evolution when compared to diesel but it is still not it is a little bit but we are trying to do, do whatever is possible with us. Now, 
Let us look at the total number of registered motor vehicles in Kerala. In 1960, it was only 0.24 lakhs, that is 24,000 vehicles only. And look at 2016, it is 101 lakh, eh? that is more than 10 million, more than 10 million from 24,000, see 10 years it has increased to increased by almost uh, four times and another 10 years again it has, what is it, uh, it has doubled and another 10 years you see it has again multiplied by almost three times and another 10 years you see how many times it has increased, uh, four times and again you see from 20 to 53, eh? how much? Again, three times. And every five years, you see, it is going almost double. You see? And from 88 in 1950, it has come to 101 in 2016. That is one year. I do not know the statistics presently. It would be nothing less than 150 or 15 million vehicles in Kerala only, not in India, I'm saying in Kerala alone. So you can imagine how much diesel and how much petrol these are uh, using. Say, for example, you see the police force in Kerala is owning so many, so many vehicles. You can see them all the time. They are running on the road. And uh, this is again a big uh, use of petrol and diesel for uh, the administrative cost. Now, the mitigation, we will see forestry options. Eh? So we have to reduce all these things. That is a simple thing, you know. We have to go for renewable power or we have to go for alternative fuels. That is the only way to reduce uh, greenhouse gas emission. Now, mitigation, we will see the forestry options. Are there any mitigation options in forestry? For that, you will, uh, let us first look at some important statistics with regard to this one. The global carbon storage in the forest, that is stored as carbon, eh? solid carbon in the forest, in gigatons. A gigaton is equal to 10 to the power of 9 tons. So it is a very, very big number. Eh? It is less like your gigabytes. Eh? It's again 10 to the power of 9 bytes. Okay. 19% of Earth's carbon stored in plants and 81% in the soil. This is a very fortunate thing for us, you know. For example, 19% of this is stored in plants, plant body, and 81% is in the soil. So the soil carbon is advantageous in the sense that it is very difficult for soil carbon to escape into the atmosphere. Unless there is serious fire happens, like forest fire and all that, even the soil carbon is burned and then it goes into the atmosphere. Otherwise, it does not. So, most, most the, when, you, when you are looking at a forest, uh, most of the time you think that, uh, see, it's so much of carbon in the wood. No. Actually, the bottom, the soil has much more. It has 81% of the carbon, not only of that plant, but also the dead plants which lived almost a couple of centuries ago. That is, the, that is how so much of carbon has come in the soil. Now, in the live biomass, it is 53%, and in the dead wood, it is 8%, and in the soil and litter, it is 39%. Okay, now, <clears throat> forest sequester carbon at the rate of 2.4 gigatons a year. So you, I have already introduced you to the term sequester. Sorry. Sequester. Eh? That is removing forests actually remove carbon at the rate of 2.4 gigatons a year. That is carbon dioxide. Eh? Forests have been identified as both source and sink. Now, what is it? I think I have told you about it. Forests have been identified both as source and sink. Why? 
you know that it is actually a storehouse of big amount of carbon. So it is actually a sink, sink for carbon, sink for carbon dioxide, whatever it is, you take it right. Now, why is it becoming a source? Yeah, when forests are destroyed, we cut down the forest, we burn the forest or natural cause of fire in the forest, then all this carbon that is held up in the sink of the forest is actually going into the atmosphere and that is it. So it is as it becomes a source. So very, very, very critical. The forests are very, very critical in uh, maintaining the carbon economy of the globe. Now, how to face this challenge? In this new scenario, soil and roots of terrestrial ecosystems are of particular importance since about 40% of the terrestrial carbon is found below ground. 40% eh? of the terrestrial carbon is found below ground. Below ground carbon has a slower turnover rates than above ground sea, which means that it can be maintained in storage over longer periods of time. So I have told you this already in the last slide that the advantage of soil carbon is that it can be maintained over a longer period of time without the being lost. However, even small changes in such large pools of carbon would be expected to have dramatic impacts on the global climate system. Under a warmer atmosphere, sudden losses of organic soil matter could exacerbate global warming. Yeah, that is they are giving say, saying about uh, that uh, if you if there is a sudden warm atmosphere, sudden warm atmosphere means that it is a fire or even increasing temperature of the atmosphere due to climate change, the whole thing can become a source for carbon. That's the uh, disadvantage. Now, how to face this challenge? What is the strategy? A strategy is an active forestry program not intended for fuel wood, could hold carbon in forest biomass on average for at least two to three centuries, while the carbon resident in the soil under forest might be even longer. So active forestry program not intended for fuel wood. Now, if a forestry program is meant for creating fuel wood, then naturally what, what happens is that if fuel wood is burned, carbon dioxide is again released. Could hold carbon in forest biomass on an average of at least two to three centuries. That is two to three hundred years while the carbon resident in the soil under forest might be even longer. So it is possible to hold the carbon under the soil for a very long time. That is the great advantage of having a uh, forest as a uh, sink for carbon. Through the manipulation of stand density and thereby shading the soil, it will be possible to reduce significantly this amount and take advantage of the additional sink thus created in forest soil. So what does it say? Through manipulation of stand density and thereby shading the soil, it will be possible to reduce significantly this amount and take advantage of the additional sink thus created in forest soils. So create a stand density so that we have a very big leaf area in the forest. Thereby we shade the soil we don't subject the soil to high temperatures. So this is the technique. Thereby, we protect a large amount of carbon within the forest. So mitigation strategies, forestry sector, carbon. So what are the mitigation strategies? Now, this is all mitigation, you know, you should not think that it is adaptation, it is mitigation because we are trying to cut down the evolution of carbon dioxide as a greenhouse gas or we are allowing its absorption into a sink. Both are allowed. Eh? 
preventing evolution as well as absorption of the greenhouse gas in the sink. So forests are really absorbing the carbon dioxide into the forest. So thereby it is acting as a sink. So it is qualifying for mitigation. Now forestry sector carbon is managed by carbon conservation, carbon storage, carbon substitution. Three main methods. It is a classification. Now let us see the details of that. Now management for carbon conservation. That is the first one. Conserve existing carbon pool through forest reserves. What are forest reserves? Actually, we are doing it. Huh? We create more of forest reserves. We keep the forest. These we usually call them reserve forests, isn't it? So reserve forests are there. That is, we don't allow encroachments. We don't allow fire, and we don't allow any kind of mishandling of the forest. Forest reserves. We keep them very safely. Reduced deforestation. Prevent all kinds of deforestation for all kinds of purposes. And in India, it is very strict, you know, by the Wildlife Act of 1972 and also by the Environment Protection Act of 1986. We have to, we are not supposed to deforest. We have to take special permission if we want to cut down a forest, any, even one tree in a forest cutting down, we have to take permission. No natural logging of the trees are allowed in Indian forests. Uh, you should know that because our rules are very strict with regard to that. Then forest management, we have to do forest management. We have the forest department to do the management. Alternative harvest practices. What is alternative harvest practices? I mean, this is actually not really meaning India. Uh, maybe some 50 years ago in India also, like in some other countries even now, the natural forests, people remove the timber for their purposes. But now in India, it is not allowed to remove timber from natural forests. Only from plantations we are allowed. So alternative harvest practices has to be practiced in such forests. That is what they are saying. Like uh, only fallen trees can be removed. You should, I mean, many countries are practicing that route. In India, even fallen trees are also not removed from natural forests. Fire and pest protection. We have to give fire and pest protection to the uh, forest. Now, you may find that the same thing is going to be repeated in other methods also. This is management for carbon conservation. So all these methods are going to conserve carbon. Okay, now, uh, now, second is management for carbon storage. Expand the storage of carbon through afforestation, reforestation. Two terms that you may, you may have to be very familiar. What is afforestation? Afforestation is afforesting or planting trees in a location which was barren, there was nothing in it. Whereas the reforestation is where the forest got destroyed, but you are going to replant it. That is reforestation. So the difference you should see, afforestation and reforestation. And third one is agroforestry. What is agroforestry? Yeah, you are having going to have agriculture along with the tree growing. That is agroforestry. This is very much practiced in uh, southern India, especially in Kerala. You will find that a uh, lot of trees are growing. We have got the jack tree. We have got the teak tree. We have got the coconut tree. So many trees are grown. And underneath that, you will be planting many other things like your uh, amorphophallus or uh, yams and uh, tapioca and uh, bananas and all these things. They are mixing, you know. We have, a, we have a tree crop and we have got a, an agri crop. So this is the speciality with that, agroforestry. Enhanced natural regeneration. Natural regeneration should be promoted. Just by protecting the forest most of the time, natural regeneration is there. You know, one of the biggest problems in all over in India in natural, promoting natural regeneration is grazing by cattle. 
and other organisms. Uh, so preventing cattle grazing can to some extent uh, promote natural regeneration. Revegetation of degraded lands, that is degraded land should be revegetated. Uh, this is and that is there. Then reduce the tillage and other agricultural practices to increase soil carbon. Now, I was telling you about agroforestry. Now, the present situation is like that. We don't promote much tillage. Tillage means the plowing of the soil and exposing the soil. Thereby, the carbon that is exposed and the chances of carbon getting lost is very high when the temperature goes up. Then management of forest products to increase in use lifetime. Uh, management of forest products to increase in use lifetime. What is that? Uh, the forest products, what is the main forest, forest product that we are having? I will say it is timber, uh, timber coming from the forest. Now, increase, I mean, products to increase in use lifetime. About now, what we have to do is that we may have to construct our houses by wood and preserve the wood and furniture all constructed with the wood and not by steel or plastic or anything like that. So the, we have to manage our forest products like that. Then third is uh, management for carbon substitution. Now, what is the carbon substitution? Use biomass to replace durable energy intensive low carbon content material that is re carbon substitution what is it actually generally nowadays we use bricks cement steel plastic etc for most of our construction needs instead of that use biomass that is wood we have to use so many of us are not using it because Wood is expensive, you know, when compared to bricks or cement and all that. But it is more environment friendly, as they say. Replace fossil fuels with sustainably grow bioenergy feed stocks. What is it? Fossil fuels. Replace fossil fuels with sustainably grown bioenergy feed stock. There are a lot of bioenergy plants. So use that instead of the fossil fuels. For example, in uh, Kerala, for example, we have a lot of uh, wood of coconut, which is not really being used. Another one is the coconut shell, the coconut shell, and uh, the this uh, other one, uh, the 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 fibrous part of the thing also, the coconut husk. So all these are bioenergy products, but we are not using them. Instead of that, we are using fossil fuels. We are using petrol, we are using diesel, we are using kerosene, all these things. Instead of that, do use the bioenergy feedstock. That is what they are advising. Now, uh, what are the action plans now to be done for this? Eh? Just look at some of the action plans. Reforesting immediately after harvest. So this is uh, the, the now the last few slides we have seen the theoretical aspects. Now we the real action plan to be implemented to maintain an active and almost continued carbon sequestration function. That is that should be our aim: uh, reforesting immediately after harvest. Uh, the problem with us is that uh, many places uh, what they do is that after harvest of a crop, after harvest of a uh, timber or whatever it is, the place is lying idle, maybe sometimes several months or several years. But we should reforest them immediately or it should be planned according to that. Say, uh, one example is uh, our rubber plantation. We remove the rubber plantation after say 25, 30 years, isn't it? After the tapping is over and all that. And uh, we should not idle that ground. Immediately after that, we should be planting maybe rubber. Okay, there are trees after all. The occasion when the foresters can change the composition of the forest, introducing new species and silvicultural methods. So we should be introducing new species and new silvicultural methods also in growing trees. 
new technologies should be practiced. Avoids long intervals with the forest soil exposed. So we should not expose forest soil for a long time. Then restoring the protective forest cover. Large areas exist where the forest has been harvested, but for various reasons, regeneration did not succeed. Now, what is it actually? A uh, forest has been harvested, but for various reasons, regeneration did not regeneration did not succeed. So, restoring the forest uh, productive forest cover. Now, what happens is that, say, in such a situation, this is actually a forest in Kerala, in uh, Nilambur area. See, a lot of land is lying idle here. You see, uh, it's exposed. Now, what happens is that then the cattle is going to come. I mean, people who are living in the surrounding areas, uh, this is a project in which I was involved. So grazing was the big problem there. And then we have started a project in which uh, we have started reforesting it uh, by planting new trees so that the area is protected. Otherwise, this gets exposed and the soil will get exposed and thereby the soil loses its carbon. Then global estimate at over 200 million hectares. There are such land in uh, uh, all over the globe, 200 million hectares. Now, expanding existing forest carbon sinks. So, uh, so we have to, uh, the existing, we may be having existing forest carbon sinks, but we have to expand. How do we do that? Reforesting to arrest erosion. Uh, erosion of the land, erosion of the soil, we have to avoid by reforesting. And adding chemical amendments to boost fertility. So we should be adding chemical amendments to boost fertility. This is another policy that we have to do. Uh, that if there are some land, you know, which are totally non-fertile, so we may have to add chemical fertilizers, although it is not recommended everywhere. Reducing shifting cultivation. What is shifting cultivation? I'm sure you, some of you at least know. Say, uh, we planned something, uh, say for example, for a long time, uh, the forest department used to allow three or four years of tapioca cultivation in their plantations of teak. Say so the first few years, there is a lot of light in the plantation, isn't it? Because the trees are small. So they used to allow tapioca. So such a uh, shifting cultivation that is from one cultivation to another, that is not should be reduced. Reforesting marginal agricultural land. What is marginal agricultural lands? We have got plenty of that in a way, you know. Say, for example, if you look at, uh, if you travel in, on our roads and look at both the sides, you find a lot of wastelands, you know. People have not planted trees, they have no agriculture, nothing. A lot of land is being wasted for some or other reason. So we should be planting trees in that. That is what they are saying. Retaining litter debris after logging operation. Now, this is also very important. Now, usual, uh, usually what uh, many people and farmers as well as even in forest department they used to do, after cutting down the trees, the land gets filled with a lot of leaves and other small branches and all kinds of debris, you know. So what they used to do before planting as another generation, they will put, set them on fire. Eh? They set them on fire so that the land becomes very clear. We think that everything gets cleaned. No, it should not be done. Actually, that litter and other things should go into the soil as carbon. Eh? If you burn it, naturally carbon dioxide is generated. Whereas otherwise, when the litter really decays inside the soil, it uh, contributes to the soil carbon. So that is the advantage. In plantations managed for pulp wood production, carbon storage can be made more effective by increasing growth rate by planting on more productive sites genetic improvement or intensive management. So what is it saying? Plantations managed for pulp wood production. There are forest department has got a lot of plantations of eucalypts, acacia, etc. for pulp wood production. 
carbon storage can be made more effective by increasing growth rate by planting more productive sites, genetic improvement or intensive management. So you can have genetic uh, uh, selection of the tree species or you can have an entirely different species and that is why they introduced the eucalypts. All the eucalypts later uh, started, the people started complaining about water scarcity, all these problems. That is entirely a different story. But we have to think about more uh, fast growing species sometimes to get it more productive. And establishing new plantations, that is another way. Uh, establishing plantations of productive species, including monospecific industrial plantations. Of course, this is sometimes against the environmental views, you know. Uh, monos, mon that is one species plantation, like eucalypts or tea or acacia, you plant it. Adequate importance should be given to hydrological requirements when introducing new and exotic species. What is that? See, like I told you about eucalypts, if uh, people think, I mean, eucalypts, uh, all these plantations, all these trees absorb a lot of water, not only eucalypts, you know, don't have that uh, wrong idea that eucalypts only will absorb a lot. Any fast growing species will absorb a lot of water. Hmm? If you are going to have a fast growing species, it means that the, for the amount of dry matter that is produced by a plant, it is consuming an equal amount of uh, water also. So water is going to be the, uh, the consumed. So, but uh, in a crowded state like uh, Kerala, we can avoid sometimes these things because people always complained about water shortages and they have more problem with water shortage than having greenhouse gases sometimes, you know. Then substituting wood biofuels for fossil fuels. This measure does not change the Sea balance, sea balance of atmosphere, since CO2 released from burning wood or biofuels is cycled back to forest biomass through photosynthesis. So instead of I was telling you about uh, the coconut waste can be used as a biofuel. So the, the, it is actually working like a cyclic manner. So for not only thermal power plant, any other thing, you can use that kind of biofuel things. By coconut waste, the shells of coconut, husk of coconut, wood of coconut, or any other tree which is not being used as a timber should be used for that. Then substituting wood biofuels for fossil fuels. Eh? Now, biodiesel is a very attractive proposition. This has the added advantage of sequestering carbon as well as replacing the fossil fuel with the renewable resources. I think some 10 or 15 years ago, this was very popular in India, growing a plant called Jatropha kurkas. What is Jatropha kurkas? See, the seed of this particular plant within this fruits, uh, this is actually a plantation in Maharashtra also, and uh, you can see that uh, these seeds contain an oil, Jatropha oil. This seed this oil can be converted to diesel biodiesel which is called the biodiesel in fact uh, there are many places where uh, this can be used for example in bangalore the city buses use biodiesel to some extent uh, some percentage is uh, biodiesel they say so this is there so biodiesel was an attractive proposition but now it is not because you know the price of diesel has come down in the international market. So that is why it is not a very attractive proposition now. Then increasing protection measures. So what is it? Insect pest outbreaks result in considerable economic losses and accumulation of combustible material in the forest. Now, insect pest outbreaks, for example, it is very common in our teak plantations. Eh? economic losses and accumulation of combust dead biomass. A lot of dead biomass is collected in the forest, which can catch fire again. Then silvicultural practices and biocontrol means should be resorted before chemical means are used. So for protecting the forest, we should be using silvicultural methods and not 
really chemicals because these pesticides can create a lot of problem when used in large quantity. If the forests are going to be sprayed with the pesticides, we cannot live here, you know, because tons and tons of that will need to be sprayed there. Then increasing fire preventive measures, more fire protection measures such as fire breaks and firefighting equipment may be needed for achieving a relatively high level of fire protection in future. See, more fire protection measures for the forest. In India, of course, we have got forest fire, but not as bad as it in USA or in uh, Australia. Still, we also have that problem in summer. So we have to take necessary preventive measures and establishing surveillance system. In the future, the main objective of advanced surveillance technology will be to minimize the loss of carbon from biomass to atmosphere, likely to be caused by either fire and insect outbreaks. So there is the best method is fire, weather prediction and fuel wood load estimations will need to be improved in forestry. Now, what is this fire weather prediction? Say, you can predict a fire if you can predict the weather. Huh? You, that, 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 you can, of course, say that there is going to be a chance of uh, uh, fire tomorrow or day after tomorrow because the temperature is going to go up. And then you should be estimating the fuel load. What is this fuel load? Yeah, that is the litter falling from the trees will be accumulating in the forest. Now, when there is a fire, it is this acting as a fuel and catching fire. So if you are going to give more surveillance or protection to those areas where the fuel load is very high on such a day, you can avoid a fire. In fact, some of these countries like USA or Australia or Canada have been spending a lot of money in this fire surveillance system. Still, you see how much forest is being lost in these countries, even with all these facilities. I have seen with my own eyes in Australia, the, they can, the, the whole continent of Australia, they can uh, see whether there is a fire burning anywhere. And they can predict the chance of a fire. Still, you see how many millions of hectares were burned last year in the fire in Australia. So this is a problem. You have to improve on all these things. So thank you for uh, attending the class today. And uh, I think I can uh, open the discussion now. If you like to ask the, some questions, I my speaker is not working, but uh, I can uh, read your questions very well here. And the, because I have opened the captions. Yeah, you can uh, unmute. And then, yeah, I think there is a question from Pranjali. Sir, how the energy from the burning timber is a green option? As the rate of extraction of the timber will be a way much higher than the rate of growth of the tree stems. That means more trees will be cut down in several days, but it will take decades to grow them back. Ah, how the burning of trees is an option. Okay, it does not mean that we should cut down the trees, but there are instances. For example, in all over India, most of the forest departments have the teak trees. Uh, teak trees are there. They are in plantations, human planted things. Now, when they harvest them after 40 or 50 years, so this is used as a furniture. So uh, there is not much of burning in that. But uh, there are cases in uh, the villages of India where they grow many trees. This is not there in Kerala, but of course in several northern Indian states. They grow several trees for fuel wood because gas, the cooking gas has not reached many villages in India still, even now. So they, and sometimes it is unaffordable, but of course this government has now made it free to many people, you know, very poor people. I mean, they are taking care not to burn, you know, 
but we can of course convert them for other uses if it is urgently not required for burning so burning timber is a green option only when we are going to run a power plant or something like that then it is an option because the car it should be cyclic i i, I showed you a diagram it should be cycled and then only uh, the carbon dioxide should be cycled and no excess carbon dioxide production should be there okay i hope that is uh, uh, you have understood pranjali the question anyone anything more okay if there are no more questions uh, i thank you all for attending the class and uh, we will meet next week and uh, the time will be announced by mr subhash and it will be communicated to you and thank you once again for the attending the class bye bye thank you sir